Okay, so I'm going to start off by being a little bit interactive. And so I'm going to ask you to hop on to your chat. So it's okay that you're not on screen. But if you're sort of listening in, I'd love to see what um, you all know. So what do you know? So we're going to go through some questions. And you can just give me your answers. There's no judgment about what you know and what you don't know. I am just trying to gauge how much do you already know about mediation? So do you have to be an attorney to be a mediator? So yes or no? Just drop it into the chat. Yes. Okay. The answer is... No, and this is um, a very common um, misconception. Uh, I have been asked many, many times, even by attorneys, how are you a mediator without being an attorney? So this is a very common misperception. And uh, the correct answer is you do not need to be an attorney. Do you have to have a license to be a mediator? Yes or no? Okay, great. So the correct answer here is no, you have to have, let me see, hold on. Yeah, you have to have a certification. So you don't have to have a license, but you have to have a certification. Do mediators have to stick to the state where they practice? So I'm in California. Do I need to mediate only in California or can I mediate across state lines? Okay, we got some mix. Go ahead and put in there. I felt like I'm playing Jeopardy. <laughs> okay, so mediators do not need to stick to the state where they practice. So they can, you can mediate across state lines. You can even um, mediate internationally. Are mediators advocates for one side or the other? Okay, the correct answer is no. Is mediation mainly good for litigation? So Adam asks the question, if it has to do anything with stuttering. Actually, it does not. It is, um, it is with the NSA. However, it is about mediation and the practice of mediation and how that can help you. So mediation is not mainly good for litigation. It is good for many different uh, situations and scenarios. If you're friends with a mediator, can you use them for mediation? And is, if so, is that good practice? Correct, it's not good practice to use your friend as a mediator because they are going to be on your side, right? They're probably not going to be neutral. Bye, Adam. Is mediation cheaper or more expensive than litigation? Yes, correct. It is much cheaper, much, much cheaper than litigation. And can both parties pick their own mediators? Okay, this is a slightly a trick question. So usually you have to agree on who the mediator is. However, if you can't agree, you can always have co-mediators and have two mediators and they're both neutral and they are co-mediating. So you can do that. Um, and there are ways for um, people to make sure that they don't come into conflict where if I want one mediator and you want another mediator, then we're fighting about who we're going to choose. So frequently what lawyers do is one side will agree to choose three who are acceptable to them. And the other side will get to choose the final one from the three that were presented. So that is a very common practice so that there is not a conflict regarding who is the mediator that we're going to use. 
Okay, the last one. Can attorney mediators also provide legal advice to the parties? If I am an attorney mediator, can I give legal advice? So the correct answer is they should not be giving legal advice. Sometimes they do, but they're really not supposed to, okay? Because legal advice is advocating and you can interpret the law. And so for that reason, if there is an attorney mediator, they need to be wearing their attorney hat if they're giving legal advice and they need to be wearing their mediator hat uh, and not give legal advice. Okay, so thank you so much for playing the little game in the beginning just to get an idea. So let me dive into a little bit about how my background um, directly impacts my work as a mediator. So I have a degree in acting and what the lessons I've learned from acting is that I am learning character motivation. I'm understanding the goals and objectives of my own character as well as the other characters in the play with me. And this is really important, okay? And then for each of these things, right? When I'm a character, I'm trying to figure out my own goals and objectives. So they're not necessarily obvious to my co-actors, my fellow actors, but I'm trying to figure that out. So when I'm on stage with them, I'm trying to learn what my fellow actors, what their characters goals and our objectives are and how to achieve my goals and objectives and as well as how to present and give speeches. Then a little bit later, fast forward to graduate school where I studied directing and the lessons that I learned from directing are that I'm learning the ability to communicate with actors to get them to do what I want them to do. I'm also able to communicate concepts and ideas to set designers, lighting designers, sound designers. I may have to do a lot of out of the box thinking because we may want to create something and we're not quite sure how to create it. I do a lot of problem solving and we have to come up with a lot of creative ideas to be able to execute on the vision that I have as the director. And the final piece that is tying everything together is about 10 years ago, I fought uh, an amateur competitions in Muay Thai kickboxing. And because I was already in my early 40s when I did my very first combat fighting experience, I really walked away with a lot of lessons from that. So facing your fears was one of them, keeping your head in the game. So if you get unfocused, you start to like falter and it can impact the way you're eating, the way you're sleeping, the way you're training. So you really have to stay very, very focused. I'm living outside of my comfort zone. The entire time I was training, I was really nervous about whoever my unknown um, person that I was going to fight, right? The competitor, who who is that person going to be? Are they going to like really hurt me? Are they going to knock me out? So all of these fears are constantly in my mind. And I had to really fight those fears to make sure they stayed like, quiet or quieter rather than disrupting me like there are days i came back home i would be training came back home and i would be exhausted and begin crying because i'm really afraid of this person who might i might, might be getting into the uh boxing ring with all right and that 98 percent of this is mental it's not physical it's mental now how does this all shape me into becoming the strong mediator that i am today well, I'm able to read between the lines or what we in theater call the subtext. So there are lines, right, that are written in the script. And then there's subtext, which is what actually are they trying to say using these words? And we did a lot of work with that. So when I am mediating, I'm constantly hearing what the subtext is. I'm reading beneath the text. I understand what people's motivations are because I did a lot of studying of that with character development. So I understand what's motivating people. I'm able to parse that out. I'm really looking deeply into the conversations to try to understand what is motivating each party. I'm able to communicate clearly with all parties in the very similar way that I was communicating with them as a director. I have to have out of the box thinking for all the problem solving that needs to happen in a mediation as well as creatively solve problems. I live outside of my comfort zone because I'm constantly involved in other people's conflicts, 
right? It's a place where most people don't want to be. And so I have to be okay being inside other people's very big conflicts. And I'm able to see the big picture, which is something that I did as a director. I was able to see really how does everything come together? How do we put the show together with the music, with the lights, with the sound, with the set, right? To be able to put something together. So in the same sense, I'm able to see that big picture view when I'm mediating between parties, whereas people are really, really focused on the thing that they want. And I can back out and see the big picture view and help guide them to a resolution. So what is mediation? the thing that Alice keeps talking about. Well, <clears throat> mediation is part of what is considered the alternative dispute resolution, also known as ADR. Now, ADR is an alternative to the court system. So if any of you have ever gone to court, have ever litigated, you know that it can take a long time and it can cost a lot of money and it costs a lot of physical, emotional, mental stress. It can make you get sick because of all the stress that you have to go through. Mediation is a healthier alternative to litigation. So it's an alternative to court. It is voluntary. So you cannot mediate unless both parties agree to mediation. If there's a conflict and you're like, I want to mediate and someone says, no, nope, not going to do it. There is no way to force them into mediation with one exception. That one exception is if a judge mandates it. And that means that you have to already be in litigation. So if you're already litigating prior to the trial date, in many cases where a judge feels like you should be able to settle this on your own through discussions, they will mandate it and say, you must go to mediation. In that instance, you can force parties who are unwilling to mediate to the mediation table. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to mediate in good faith, right? They might sit at the table and just say, no, I'm not gonna do this because I just wanna go to trial. That's totally possible. However, if you show bad faith, it is possible that the mediator can write a mediator's report to the court to let them know, yes, you did indeed come to mediation, Yes, indeed, you spent the time mediating. However, you are not here in good faith. You did not try very hard to get to a resolution. And that will be reflected when the judge, you know, makes an award. Now, mediation is always confidential. Okay, so what is said in mediation cannot be brought against you in court. You can't go to mediation, come back and say, hey, guess what I learned? I learned all of this other dirt on the other person, let me bring it up during litigation. It's always confidential, all right? We also mentioned it's cheaper. It's also less emotional. So court can be extremely emotional. It is dragged out over months and months and months. And you might have to do depositions where the other side's attorneys are asking you questions. You may have to testify in court. You may have to find people to testify on your behalf and maybe they're not going to be willing to do it like they thought, you thought in the beginning that they would be. So for all these reasons, it can be extremely emotional and put you under a lot of duress. Mediation, while it also can be emotional, it is nowhere near the level of litigation. And furthermore, if you're really uncomfortable sitting face to face with someone, whether it's over Zoom or in person, the mediator can opt to put you in separate rooms. They can either physically put you in separate rooms or they can put you in different Zoom rooms <clears throat> so that you'll have a comfortable space that you can talk just to the mediator separately and the mediator can go back and forth between the two rooms. They call this shuttle diplomacy is one way that they can talk about it. Caucus is another name that we give it. If you're doing caucus, it means that you're talking to the mediator separately, all right? And also mediation does not have to be legal and binding. So at the end of a mediation, I will give a memorandum of understanding. Basically that is written in English. It is not written in legalese. 
just the terms that people have agreed to and people can sign it. However, it does not have to be legal and binding. Okay, but just the way it is, then it's not legal and binding. Now, if both parties agree, we would like this to be a legal and binding document, the mediator can just drop in the clause that says both parties agree that this is a legal and binding document, all right? And then it becomes legal and binding. But generally, it is not legal and binding. The other thing that mediation is good for is to preserve relationships, right? Or rebuild broken relationships. Because when you go to litigation, it's nothing but tearing people apart. Litigation really encourages people to fight. And so it really does a lot of harm to people, particularly if you're trying to continue to have a relationship with them. Any questions about what mediation is? I want to pause here and take some questions if you have any. You're welcome to come off of mute. You're also welcome to write it in the chat. And while some of you are thinking about any questions, I would love to know if anyone has ever mediated before. Mm. You can Alice, put in the I, yes. I have a quick question. Um, can um, mediation ever turn 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 to litigate litigation? Yes. So mediation can turn to litigation. So let me, that's, I'm glad you brought that question up. So mediation can happen at any time. It can happen pre-litigation. It can happen right after you file the litigation. It can happen all throughout the litigation during the discovery process or after the discovery process. It can happen a week before trial. So at any point in time, and you can try multiple times. So some of these very big cases may try mediation two or three times. The other thing that is very similar to mediation in the litigation world is a settlement conference. The settlement conference is basically a mediation. The only difference is that the judge plays the role of the mediator. So the judge becomes neutral at that point in time and the settlement conferences usually happen before trial because the judges are hoping and praying that you're going to settle it. So they will come and they will be the mediator and they will try to get it settled for you at that time. So you can have multiple attempts at mediations so that you can get to some kind of a settlement agreement. Thank you for that question, Pam. Any other questions? Okay, moving on. What does a mediator do? So I'm going to just stop share for a moment. So what does a mediator do? Well, my job is to keep people calm so that there can be communication. So one of the things that I like to talk about, it's one of my favorite topics actually, is how heightened emotions can wreck clear communication. So when someone is defensive, angry, frustrated, irritated, annoyed, any of these negative emotions, their ability to hear is greatly diminished. Will they hear your words? Absolutely. Will they hear your meaning? More than likely, no. How do I know this? Because when I mediate, I frequently ask, can you please repeat back what it is that you've heard? And if the other person is having a lot of negative thoughts or feelings, they will either be able to say maybe 10% of what they heard, or sometimes it's zero. And this is with them nodding their head, looking like they're listening and being quiet. And then when I say, what was it that you heard? Very frequently, they'll say, I'm sorry, I can't repeat anything because I don't remember. Okay. So I help keep people calm so that they can hear. And at any point in time, if anyone starts to feel emotional, I bring them into separate rooms immediately. Not all mediators do that, but I do that because I don't feel like it is productive 
to stay in the same room, glaring at each other, being upset with one another, because all you're doing in that room when you're feeling that upset is you're trying to mask your strong emotions. And while you're trying to mask those emotions and keep your composure, you're not hearing anything that the other side is saying. So my job is really to try to keep you feeling calm so that you can hear the other side. I stop all bad behavior. So I might tell people at the very, very beginning, I will say, okay, this is what, what's going to happen. You can't interrupt. It's my biggest rule. You can't call each other names. You can't yell at each other. You can't raise your voices. You can't disparage one another, right? And if you do any of these things, I will ask you to stop. And yes, it kind of is like a timeout in couples therapy, all right? But I lay down the ground rules and believe it or not, people respond very favorably to the ground rules. I also ask people, please don't use the words lie, liar, or lying. Instead, please use the phrase, I have a different perspective because it helps keep the emotional temperature low, right? Well, you can imagine how defensive you'll feel if someone just outright said, you're lying. Whereas if I said to you, well, I have a different perspective on that, it's not going to make you feel so defensive, right? I make sure that my language is neutral so that it never feels like I'm judging either side. You want to make sure that you keep all judgment out. So if you are being a mediator, and I don't mean a professional one, but you're mediating between two people, your friends, your family members, that sort of thing, you want to make sure that you are not judging either side. Because if you're judging, then it's going to come across and you're not going to do as good of a job mediating between the parties. So you want to make sure that you are judgment free and you are neutral. Okay. Uh, so I prevent bad behavior. Um, and then I keep the confidentiality. The other thing that's really important is I help them distinguish between their positional bargaining and their interest-based bargaining. So let me talk a little bit about that. So position-based bargaining is when you have a position such as, I want to get a cat versus the other position, which is, no, I don't want to get any more pets. Okay. So those are two positions. Someone wants a cat, someone does not want a cat. Now, when we dig deeper, what I try to do is I try to find the interests, right? Which is, why do you want a cat? What are some of the things that's driving you to want a cat? Well, you might want an animal companion. Uh, you might be lonely. Um, <clears throat> there are many reasons, right? Maybe you have another cat and you want that cat to have a playmate. Right, so you, I, I ask a lot of questions in mediation so that I can get to the interests of both parties. Then I may ask the other person, why don't you want a cat? They might say, well, I don't have time to take care of it. Um, I don't wanna have a house full of fur. Um, my partner really lets the cat sleep on the bed and I really don't want that, right? So there could be a lot of reasons that's given. And then the idea is to be able to dig so deep that some of those interests actually overlap from that point you can try to create a solution that works for everyone because you're working from a place where there's an overlap of interests and so what i do as a mediator is i'm trying to find out the interests of everyone more than likely when they've come to mediation it means that all communication has failed it's the reason why they're coming to mediation and it also usually means they have not done deep digging to find out if there are common interests between the two of them or more of the parties. So as a mediator, I ask a lot of questions. A lot of the questions I can tell when I ask them have never been asked before. Frequently I can tell because it requires deep thought from the person I asked in order for them to be able to answer the question. And sometimes when they answer the question, it's new information for the other side, right? So that's a lot of what I do as a mediator. Okay, then what doesn't a mediator do? Let me talk a little bit about that. So a mediator does not provide legal 
advice, financial advice, or psychological advice. So I want to make sure that you're not asking, if you ever go into mediation, that you're not asking them for any kind of advice whatsoever because they are not supposed to be giving you any of that, okay? I'm also not here to make the decision for you about anything, right? The decision is for you to make. I am here to help facilitate the decision-making process. I'm here to ask a lot of questions so that you can figure out the best decision, but ultimately it's your decision. Interestingly enough, people might call me later on and say, hey, by the way, Alice, we mediated with you about a year ago. We came up with a memorandum of understanding and the other party, they've broken their agreement. They're not doing it. Can you help? I cannot enforce anyone's agreement. I don't have any legal power. I can't do anything with the courts in order to make sure that people follow their agreements. Okay. The only thing that I can do during that time, if someone calls me and says that, is I can offer to broker another deal. Right. Someone recently called me. They had gone through a mediation with someone else. They had a payment plan. And the person who was supposed to pay everything back failed to pay them back on time. So she called me and said, I need another payment plan because the one we have is not working. So can you work with us to come up with a payment plan? All right, so I can help you via mediation again, but I cannot help you enforce the previous mediated agreement, okay? Um, I cannot offer personal opinions and I cannot provide guarantees of any way, shape, or form. Now, what kind of situations are good for mediation? Well, one of the ones that I do a lot of is divorce. I do divorce mediations. I do a lot of workplace conflict mediations. I've done a lot of unlawful detainer. What that means is housing, real estate, right? So eviction cases where someone is getting kicked out either because of non-payment or rent or for some other reason, those are very easily mediated. Commercial real estate cases are easily mediated. Personal injury cases are also mediated a lot. The, so these are sort of the ones that are in the court. Then there's the community ones, right? So there are neighbor to neighbor disputes. So a lot of times people are arguing because if we in California, Northern California live in a hilly area and it's very common in some neighborhoods for people to want to sue each other because someone's trees are getting tall and they're blocking someone else's ocean view. So then they go into mediation to try to figure out what to do with the trees that are blocking someone's multi-million dollar view. Uh, so anything to do with neighbors, um, I've had um, just, you know, different kinds of contracts, breach of contract cases. Um, so any of these are good for mediation. Mediation is really good for any time there is a conflict and you want to resolve it without going to court. Or if you go to court and you want to get out of the lawsuit, then those are good times to go to mediation. Any questions at this point? I want to pause. or comments even. Alice, this is Pam, Pam, Pam again. Um, so what type of workplace con, con, con conflict or sit, situation could you visualize um, helping people who stutter with? A workplace conflict um, with people who stutter? I'm trying to think here. That's a good question. Usually it could be like, I'm guessing that it could be something where there's a hostile work environment or people are being made fun of or people are being discriminated against. And so in those cases, you can mediate it with the person who is causing the conflict with the person who is stuttering so that you come out with favorable outcomes for both parties. 
So should that be like a person's like supervisor, like acting as the mediator? Should it be human re- 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 resources? What would that best look like? Yes. So I love this question because it's very nuanced. All right. Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, many supervisors will try to mediate it and many of them do not possess the skills that are needed so they do a bad job of it uh they might come in advocating for one side they might um have judgment when they're talking to someone they might not ask a lot of questions they might make assumptions about what's happening they might accuse someone of doing something without really getting to the bottom of it. So frequently they do try to mediate it, but because it requires a high level of skill and they don't realize that, they may end up botching the job. Now, once they fail, it gets pushed to HR and HR will try. And depending on the skill level of the HR person, it may or may not help. Sometimes the HR person has an agenda to protect the company. So in that case, the other person, the employee might feel like, oh, well, you know, I don't feel like you're neutral. I feel like you're siding with the company. And so you're doing whatever it takes to side with the company, right? So in those instances, I get called as an outside mediator because the supervisor has failed and HR has failed. And they need someone who is a professional mediator to come in to help fix the scenario. Does that answer your question, Pam? Yes, it does. And just as a pig, piggy, piggy, piggyback, can um, can mediation be held against the employee? No, but I need to understand a little bit better when you say held against. Well, like... You know, if an employee has had some kind of a situation that required some type of mediation, um, you know, and like the supervisor botched it, as you said, and then like HR might not really have the best skill. So somebody from the outside had to be called in you, for example, is there any possibility that the supervisor and HR could be like so ticked off <laughs> by that being the route that had it, that it had 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 to go that they like retaliate a, a, against the employee that had the problem? Obviously, it is always a possibility. However, number one, it's illegal. So, you know. <laughs> They do engage in retaliation. They're engaging in some kind of illegal activity. And what is really interesting um, about being a mediator is that you're right pretty much on the front lines of humanity and see how human behavior acts. And I have found it to be the case where when I do a mediation at the workplace, if it is successful, meaning we clear out all of the issues, usually the, the actor who is working in bad faith, by this I mean the person who's really causing the lot of conflict, deliberately causing it, usually will quit shortly after the mediation process is completed, mainly because there are people who thrive in conflict. And I for those of you who are not like that, may find it difficult to believe or imagine, but some people like conflict. And so they like to stay in a workplace where there's conflict. And if you decrease or eliminate the conflict, it's no longer fun for them to work there. So I have heard in conversations with organizations where they had someone, they say, this is a person who is causing a lot of problems. The the company paid a lot of money to go through the mediation process. We resolved everything. And then maybe within six weeks, the person who's causing problems ended up leaving. So that's happened on multiple occasions. So I don't know if that answers your question entirely, Pam, but I see. It does. That. Thank, 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 thank you. I just was really curious about that. So that makes sense. <laughs> yes. Now, let me go ahead and move on. Um, and I'm going to talk about the different types of mediations. All right. 
So there's three different types of mediations. And I'm going to go through these relatively quickly because I don't want to bore you with the, the finer details of it, but I want you to at least understand the three different kinds of mediations and what, like what is different between them, okay? So facilitative is a lot of what I do. So I ask a lot of questions. I uncover the needs, as I mentioned. I don't offer opinions or solutions. And so basically I am facilitating a conversation amongst the parties. That's why it's called facilitative. So this works in community mediations, divorce mediations and workplace conflict mediations because I'm trying to facilitate a different kind of a relationship between the people. And I'm trying to facilitate a resolution, okay? Then there's evaluative, which is frequently used in litigated cases. So the difference with evaluative is that you are evaluating the case, all right? It's much more direct, shorter mediation times than facilitated or transformative. Transformative can take the longest, potentially. Um, you might propose a solution. You give opinions to say, hey, if you continued with litigation, it's going to cost X amount of dollars. Um, if you win, it's going to cost this X amount of dollars for you to win. If you lose, this is how much money it's going to cost. If you settle today, this is how much it's going to cost. So you're evaluating a lot of values. It could be money. It could be time. Whatever it is, you're basically comparing apples to apples, right? How much is it if you do it here? How much is it if you do it that there? You might point out the weaknesses or strengths in the case if it is some kind of litigate, litigated case. Um, and most attorney mediators definitely use the evaluative model. So you're trying to push people to a settlement by comparing. If you were to go to litigation, here's what you, here are your risks versus you're not taking a risk today and you can get this much money or you risk losing or you risk winning and still not getting a whole lot of money because now you spent a lot of money on your lawyer's fees, right? So for these reasons, a lot of times they'll go over all the numbers. And so when they're doing that, that is called an evaluative mediation. These are great for personal injury cases, uh, most litigated cases, landlord tenant cases, right? You can also talk about, I usually talk about if you go into court today and try this and you get evicted, you'll now have an eviction on your record. Do you want the eviction on your record or do you want to settle it and not have an eviction on your record, right? So I'm giving them things to compare so they can choose what they want. The third kind of mediation is transformative and it's called transformative because you're trying to transform the relationship between the parties, right? So it allows the people to recognize the needs and wants of the other side. It transforms the people. So this is really good for example, um, reconciliation right? I have had parents and their adult children reconcile. So they're trying to change the relationship from something that is either non-existent to something that is existing or something that is very, very bad to something that is more positive. So the pros are that you have a deeper understanding of each other's side. However, it can take a long time, possibly, um, and it might not have a result, right? It could be that both parties are like, yep, yeah, we still don't see eye to eye. I still don't like you. You still don't like me and nothing has changed. That is a potential. And these are good for neighbor to neighbor conflicts. I have seen neighbor to neighbor conflicts transform in literally 60 minutes where they talk about the noise that one person is suffering and they sort of been at each other for the past three years uh, with very little face-to-face -face, uh, interactions. They're just bang banging on the ceiling and the other person's freaking out because upstairs they're hearing banging from the downstairs neighbor. And once they understand each other's perspective and what's going on and what experiences they're having, suddenly they're a lot more empathetic towards each other and it changes their relationship to one another. So family conflicts, reconciliation, and also good for workplace conflicts. Any questions on these three? Okay. If not, let me move on. I'm going to talk a little bit about some case studies. So maybe that will be what words work the best to change someone's mind? That is a very big question. 
it isn't really so much the words. So let me talk about the little magic trick that I perform. It's my secret weapon. It's what makes me a good mediator. I like to think of the analogy of a ship, a very large ship. And when you change the direction of a very large ship by two or three degrees, and then they continue to travel for thousands of miles, the end destination is going to be significantly different, right? And so in that same way, it's not so much specific words that I'm using that you can use in every single scenario, but I try to change the perspective of people by two or three degrees. And by changing it by two or three degrees, I have a huge differential in the outcome. So maybe what will help is when I go into the case studies, I'll talk about how I resolve them and you'll sort of understand like what I'm talking about when I say changing people's um, mindset by two or three degrees. Okay, so let's talk about this first one, landlord tenant. Case study, landlord is evicting the tenant and her adult daughter. The parties have been fighting for over two months. The judge mandated mediation, but neither side felt like it would be helpful. And they articulated this to me. They said, hey, we're here. We're signing up for our mediation. We do not think it's going to settle. We think it's just going to go to trial, but we are here because we have to be here. Great. We go into mediation. The landlord has an attorney. The tenant does not. So the landlord proceeds to sort of bully the uh, tenants in this mediation. He says, you know what? It's fine if we don't settle because I'm going to go into that courtroom and I am going to win because I feel like I have a very strong case and you're going to have to pay all my attorney's fees, which at this point is now up to $25,000. So that's fine. If you don't want to do it this way, we can just go to court and I'm fine with that. And then I asked them to please leave the room after they said what they were going to say. So then I was started speaking to the tenants. Now they've been fighting and fighting and trying not to move. And the way that I changed the perspective in this particular case is I asked one question. The question was, what is this conflict doing to your mental health, your emotional health, and your physical health? Okay, I'm gonna say that one more time. What is this conflict doing to your mental health, emotional health, and physical health. And all of a sudden, they both started weeping. And they had a long list of things that were going wrong with them. They had headaches. They had stomach aches. Their hair was falling out. A lot of horrible things were happening to them due to the stress that this was causing. My next question, what can you do to get out of this conflict. And all of a sudden the mom said, I need to move. I need to get out of this place. I need to get away from this landlord who's been terrorizing us. And I said, okay, do you have a place to go? She said, yes. And I asked, how soon do you want to move? And she said, I'm happy to move in one month. I'll pay the rent and I'll leave in a month. And I said, I wanna make sure that you're not committing to something that is too soon or that you cannot do. And she said, no, you have completely made me realize that I'm suffering needlessly because I'm trying to stay here. And now that you've told me, oh my goodness, I can move and I can get away from this. I can feel much better. I'm going to do that. So I went back outside and told the landlord and his lawyer that, the, that their tenants were moving out in one month and paying the rent and both of their mouths fell open. And they said, what did you say in there? And I just said, I worked my magic. But that's what I'm talking about. I ask a lot of questions to try to get at the root of what's happening in the situation. And it's not necessarily the words that I'm using. It's the questions I'm asking. So that was that in the landlord tenant. Any questions on that one? Before I move on to the next one. Okay. I had another one that was an inheritance case. This one was six close, very, very close-knit siblings from Mexico. They inherited their family home when their parents passed away. The parents gifted the house to them to keep it in the family and use it as needed. So they said, this is for you kids. We know you love one another. If anyone ever needs a place to stay, 
You can live in the house and that's it. They didn't really think about anything else that might happen, right? They just thought that's great. And they didn't think about in this scenario, in that scenario, what might happen and lay out everything. So now the six siblings have this house. Two of them decided let's put it into an LLC because they consulted with an attorney who said you should put it into an LLC to protect it. So they did that. However, three years later, two of the siblings wanted out of the property for different reasons. And so they wanted to be bought out. It was a huge rift in their sibling relationships due to this ask. Okay. And they'd been fighting with it and they were very, very upset. An LLC is a company, like they're putting it into a company, right? Like I am Shakina Mediation and Arbitration LLC. So it's a company. So it's put it into, I believe they may have actually put it into a trust. So it's protecting it. Okay. But they called it an LLC um, so that it can be protected in case somebody gets sued or anything like that. Well, now they're not having a good time together. They're very upset because they're all drifting further and further apart because they're upset. So when I came to mediate, I asked a lot of questions. I asked them, why do they want to get bought out? Everyone said, nobody is supposed to be bought out. If you don't want to be a part of this, just leave. Mom and dad never anticipated that somebody wants to get bought out. We were never supposed to sell the house, not to outside people, not to each other. It's just a house for us to have and stay in. Well, one of them said, I want to be bought out because I went to go write my will and my attorney asked me, what properties do I own? I completely forgot about it. And I realized at that point in time that I own one sixth of this family home and I have to somehow will it to my children. Do I want to will them one sixth of a home? No. He said, no, I don't want to do that. I just want to be able to take the cash and I would like to give it to my kids. So that was the reason why this one sibling wanted to be bought out. One other sibling said, I don't care what you pay me. It doesn't have to be one six. I just want out. So pay me whatever you think is fair. I don't want out. Right? So for the siblings, they were all fighting because they didn't want this to happen. However, it was very apparent to me that there was a reasonable solution to all of this because you have one sibling who is going to be able to make it equal because he's not demanding the same thing as the other one. So across the board, I asked everyone, all the siblings, how much are you willing to pay? What is one sixth? What is your understanding of one sixth? And people said 40,000, somebody said 50,000. And the person who wanted the money said 66,000 is what his belief of what it was. Now they all understood that 66,000 was one sixth, but they were not willing to pay. 66,000 to two of their brothers. So we got one of the siblings down to 60,000 and he was stopping there. He said, I'm not, we're going to have to fight about this because I'm not going to settle for any less. And the other brother said, well, I don't really care. Just give me whatever. So then the, all of the family wanted to give each of them 60,000, but they didn't, weren't in agreement on that amount. So I said, wait a minute, but you all agree to 50,000, right? 50,000 to each brother. And they said, yes. So I said, you have a deal here. You give one brother 60,000, you give the other brother 40,000. That way you've spent 50 and 50 and we can memorialize that one brother is sacrificing $10,000 so that his other brother can get the 10,000 that more that he wants. And I asked the two brothers, is this okay with you? And they said, yes, it's fine. And then the other sibling said, well, that's not fair. We don't feel like it's fair because one brother's getting less money. And I said, but you have a deal. What you have is you have a deal. So if you can get past the fairness and just feel like it's equitable, you have a deal. So via mediation, we were able to get to that conclusion. And the last one I wanna share is a move away. So a couple shared two kids. One parent wanted to move to San Diego to be closer to her parents for help watching the kids. And the other was working for the police department, couldn't move. And she also refused to move or let her kids move. So they had been fighting for months and months and months. So when we came in, one of the things I did is I moved down from position, right? The position is I want to move away versus I don't want you to move away, right? Um, sorry, I didn't say couple. It's like an X. So they're X's from each other. And so... 
That's their position. They came in, one wanting to move and the other one saying, no, you're not allowed to move. So I put them in caucus sessions, which is what I do when there's an impasse. I put them in separate rooms and I went to each side and I said, what can you offer the other side to make them want to do what you want them to do? So the person who's trying to move said, I'm willing to fly back and forth twice a month with the kids so that she will agree to me moving down to San Diego. It was going to be the difference between the Bay Area and San Diego, which is like maybe an hour and a half of a plane ride. So she said, in order to get her degree, that's what I would like to offer. Then I went to the other side and I said, what can you offer to try to make it appealing for the other person to stay? And she said, I will give her a lot more money and spousal support. Well, when those two came out suddenly, because there were two very good offers, this set of parents decided they wanted to consider those options. So they went from fighting to having two good offers and they went away to try to think about it because now they had something that felt like, oh, these are reasonable options. So what I do as a mediator is I'm trying to help them build value so that they can make offers to one another that are going to be appealing. So you're not just taking what it is that you want. You're also giving something in exchange. And finally, I just want to talk about quickly about the different things that you have to negotiate in a divorce mediation. So there's typically a co-parenting plan. People figure out a child support, spousal support, also known as alimony, how to split assets and debts, what to do with the marital home. Are they going to sell it? Is one side going to buy out the other? Are they going to remain co-owners with one of them continuing to live there? So these are generally the topics that people have to discuss in divorce mediation. So at this point, I'd like to pause and take any questions um, because I'm going to share a video with you so that you get to see what a mediation actually looks like. All right, so for the next 18 minutes or so, I'll have a video. So before I start the video, are there any questions about how I do mediations, um, how I can change people's minds or, you know, adjust their perspectives in ways that they feel like they feel like it's a win-win. Yeah, I, 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 I had sort of a general question. Um, I, I'm just curious what what advice you would have for someone who, who for a person who, 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 who stutters, who's interested in being a mediator, either professionally or, 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 or personally. And I mean, of course, people who stutter can can thrive in all sorts of speaking situations. But but nonetheless, this is one that's, you know, where I think you're choosing your words are, are you know, you have to choose your words very carefully. And there's a lot of emotions and and uh, uh, there's just just a lot at stake. So, like, how how do you how how, how would you advise someone to 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 deal with the additional challenges of 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 of, of, of having a stutter in, in that scenario? That's a very good question, Sam. Thank you for asking it. Um, I actually know a mediator who does stutter, and he does mediate su successfully. So, and I think that really, even with a stutter, I think what's more important is not so much that you're not stuttering, but that it's you're choosing the words carefully so that you're not offending someone. So frequently, people can offend someone with the slightest choice of words. And so I don't think the stutter is so much the issue. People even without stuttering can offend someone because they're either speaking too fast or not choosing the words wisely. So I think in that sense, as long as you can speak slowly and calmly, I think those are, and you can listen. Most of the time, if you're a mediator, you're going to be listening. You're not going to be talking. If you're a good mediator, you may ask a few questions. And most of the time, you're listening to the people talk. So I don't think it matters if you're stuttering if you're a good listener, if you can listen deeply and you can hear what people are saying and can parse out and understand what's going on, that is what's going to make you a great mediator because you're not going to be speaking. I speak maybe 2% of my mediations, 98% of the time, the other parties are speaking. You want as the mediator to be almost invisible and you want the people to feel like, oh, 
we were able to have this great conversation that we cannot have outside of mediation. And why? It's because you set the stage, you set the ground rules, and you set everything up so that everyone is safe. Does that answer your question, Sam? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. Setting the tone is extremely important. Setting expectations is also extremely important. The most amount that you are going to talk is probably at the very beginning. You have a five-minute mediator's introduction where you talk about what the ground rules are. And also, I let people know, hey, I do expect you to actively listen. So at different points in time, I might ask you to please repeat yourself so that I can tell that you're understanding what's being said. And then only after you, you uh, not repeat yourself, sorry, repeat what the other person said. After you've repeated what the other person has said, then you can respond to what they said. But first, I might ask you. And I will let them know, I'm not going to do it the entire time. I may not do it every time but there will be times where I'm going to ask you to please repeat what you heard. And you might think like, why are you going to tell them that? Because if I don't tell people that, and then I do it later on, people get offended. I had a case recently where they were in two separate rooms the entire time. So I skipped that part. I skipped the part where I say, please listen carefully because I'm going to ask you to repeat things because I thought, well, they're not in the same room. So I don't need to say that. Well, it was my mistake. Because guess what? When I was alone in the room with this client and her attorney, she began to get very upset with me. And I said, I don't feel like you're listening to me. Can you do me a favor? Can you please let me know what it is that you heard me say? And she started getting upset. She said, why are you treating me like this? And like, I'm not a child. And I, so that would not have happened if I had set the expectation early on that if I feel like you're not hearing me, I'm going to ask you to repeat back what I said. So it's so important to set it up because otherwise people don't know what you're doing and they feel like you're being condescending or you're treating them like a child. But if you tell them beforehand, they're like, okay, I know what she's doing. She told us in the beginning she's gonna do it. Now she's doing it. Okay. All right. Is everyone ready to watch uh, a sample mediation? Okay, let me see. I'm going to start it. Hold on a second. Okay, let me share my screen. Let's see. I think this is the right screen. Oh, I'm going to stop it because I don't think I did a share uh, sound. Fine. All right, so this is a... Oops, hold on a second. I'm not sure. Um, sorry about that. Um, okay. All right. So this is going to be a sample mediation so you can kind of see what it looks like typically need to mediate they may not need all five but the five general issues are co-parenting plan child support. the event that you find that i'm saying things that you're like oh i wouldn't do that it's something that i just tell everyone so number one the mediation is confidential and if we have agreements i will list them out and give you a memorandum of understanding at the end of the mediation session now, I have some general guidelines that I would like everyone to follow during the course of the mediation. Number one, the biggest rule being please do not interrupt each other. Um, it is very harmful to the communication. So if you are interrupting, I will ask you to stop. I also ask that you keep your voice at a level um, tone as well as not raise your voice, don't yell or scream. Also, please do not call each other names. Please also do not disparage one another. And if you can, just stay calm during the entire time. Now, please also do not use the words lie, liar, or lying. In the event that you feel like the other person is saying something that is not true, you should have something to take notes with. You can jot a note 
for yourself and you'll have plenty of time to correct that. And instead of saying lie, liar, or lying, please use the phrase, I have a different perspective. Now, at any point in time, I may pull you into a separate room to have a discussion. This might happen because there's an impasse and I want to help you get past the impasse. This also might happen because the emotions are getting a little too high in the room. Also, if you feel like you're getting too emotional, you're feeling frustrated, angry, annoyed, um, threatened, anything like that, you may please say to me, Alice, I need to speak to you privately, and then we can go into a private caucus. Everything that's in that caucus is confidential to this joint session, meaning whatever you tell me in the private room, I will not bring back out to the other party unless you give me permission to do so. Any questions? No, that sounds good. No. Okay. So since Kavita, you reached out to me first to mediate, I would love to hear um, on the agenda, I believe we have a move away request yes. from you. Yes. So if you could begin and then we'll go from there. And then Richard, what I would like for you to do is uh, listen carefully. There may be times while I will ask you what it is that you heard before I, give you a chance to respond, okay? Okay. All right, any questions about the process? Uh, no, it's clear. No, no, I don't think so. Okay, great, all right, Kavita. So, um, you know, I need help, and um, the best thing to do for me and for the kids is to move to the Bay Area because I need that help, you know? My parents are there, my family are there, and it's just gonna be just easier for me and for the kids. Would you, would Hang on one second, Richard, okay? I'll All give right. you a chance to uh, okay. respond in a moment. Yeah, so, um, you know, the kids are in sports and they need, you know, they both have games sometime at the same time, so I won't be able to do that, um, drive them both, and then he's not around, even even if we were, you know, in LA, he's, he's never around because he's always working, so I need that extra help from my parents. Right. So moving to Bay Area is the best, Thing to do. The way that I make sure that people are hearing each other and they are communicating without misunderstandings is by engaging them to use their active listening skills. And I do that by asking people to repeat what it is that they heard. This is very critical because although people look like they're listening, they actually might be thinking about the response. They might be thinking about their emotions and their emotional response to what is happening from the other side of the table. And for these reasons, their listening is diminished. And so I will use this particular technique in order to make sure that both parties are listening. Richard, if you could, before we begin, let me know what it is that you heard from Kavita. Uh, well, what I heard is that she wants us to live in different cities. She wants to move uh, you know, up to the Bay Area because her family is there. Um, and of course, she'd be bringing the kids with her. One of the things she said that really kind of rub, kind of confuses me a little bit, she said one of the things that is, that is a problem for her is that because of my acting, I'm never around. What makes her think that if she moves away to the Bay Area and we're in different cities, that I'm going to be around more. I'm going to be around even less. I can't be traveling up and back and forth between the Bay Area and, and Southern California all the time. Okay, I, hold on. I just want to know what, what you heard, and then we can go into your uh, response. Okay, well, that's what I heard, that she wants to move to the Bay Area. She wants to take the kids with her. Uh, I, that's, that's not going to work. It's not going to work for me. Okay, and then hang on one minute. Kavita, is that everything you said? Did he get everything? Yeah, I, you know, I'm going to move to Bay Area. But I think that's that's it. I know he's going kind of off. Okay, the, but he but he got he heard everything you said, right? Yes. Okay. Now, Richard, if you could please respond to what Kavita said, that'd be great. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I. I don't think that the solution is going to work for me. I mean, I understand that she wants to be in the Bay Area because her family is there. That's not unreasonable. But it's also true that I can't travel back and forth to the Bay Area between the Bay Area and Los Angeles all the time because I have 
I have to be in LA in order to be able to pursue my uh, business of, you know, my career as an actor. Uh, I really think that it would be better if we both lived in the same city and I certainly can't move to the Bay Area when she does so that she will see me more often or so that I get to see the kids more often. I, you know, we're, we're both living in, in Southern California and I don't feel like I see the kids as much as I want to now or as much as it's good for them. You know, they're both, they're both growing boys. They need their father's presence. And if she moves to the Bay Area, then I'm going to see them even less. And I don't think it's going to be good for the kids. Okay. Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. Whenever there is an impasse, one of the strategies that I employ is the caucus session. What this means is that I speak with each party privately so that they can express more of what they're thinking and feeling than they could when the other party was in the room with them. So I'm going to ask both of you uh, to caucus for the moment because we are at a bit of an impasse. And so what that means is that I will speak to you privately and then I'll come back and speak to you privately. And I will go back and forth. Sometimes this is called shuttle diplomacy. And mm -hmm. then um, once you both feel comfortable coming back to a joint session, that is when we will do so, okay? So first I'd like to speak with Richard. Frequently, I notice that people get very emotional and one of the things that happens when people are getting emotional is that their amygdala is hijacking their logical and reasoning part of their brain. So if you are in a conversation and you are feeling that way, you actually cannot hear the other person, you cannot solve the problem, and you cannot communicate clearly. So I bring people into a session so that they can sort of vent to me whatever it is that is bothering them, that is making them upset, and hopefully bring their amygdala back down so that they can start to think again. So Richard, talk to me about what's happening with you. Uh, you know, this is just very frustrating. She always brings up the same issues that we've already talked about and that I've told her won't work for me. And she keeps insisting on the same things. I mean, moving up to the Bay Area, that's not going to work. How could she possibly think that that could work? I just, I don't know. I just don't get it. I'm trying to keep my cool, but it's really, really hard for me to do that. Yeah, I understand it's really, really frustrating to deal with something, especially when you feel like your children might move far away from you. Exactly. I mean, that's a huge issue. So what I do is I try to acknowledge their feelings by mirroring the things that they're saying so that they feel heard and they feel understood. And then I move towards interest-based negotiating. What I would like for you to do while I go speak to Kavita is I would like for you to think about how can we solve for both issues, for you to be able to see your children on a regular basis mm -hmm. and for Kavita to somehow be near family so that she can have help taking care of the children, okay? Uh, okay. I'll give you some time to think about it and then I'll go talk to Kavita and when I come back, I'd like to hear some of your ideas. Okay, I'll think about it, try to come up with some solutions. Great, thanks. So I just want to remind you that this caucus is confidential so anything you tell me will remain confidential. I will not go and tell Richard. I will only tell him anything that you let me tell him. Okay? So I'd like to hear sort of what is happening with you right now. Um, I'm just frustrated. Um, it's just, you know, sad because I, you know, I didn't think this was going to happen, but it is happening. So, um, you know, moving to the Bay Area would help me a lot because throughout our marriage, he always worked. There was never a time to where, oh, I'll be home at this time. And it was always just me left alone, you know, to um, take care of the kids. But now that the kids are older, you know, they are, uh, you know, have sports, you know, different sports, different time. Sometimes you have to go out of town. So it just makes sense to me that you know, I moved to the Bay Area, or we moved to the Bay Area, that way my, my family can help out, because, you know, that's the only way and it's best for everyone. And I'm, you know, I'm just kind of losing my mind because I am always so busy. Right. So I understand it's very, very difficult to try to raise your kids down in Los Angeles and that you'd like to be closer to your family. Mm -hmm. So what I would like for you to do is um, spend a few moments 
thinking about how you could resolve both goals. The mm -hmm. goal of being closer to your family so that they can help you as well as making sure that Richard also has a chance to be able to see the kids on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So while I go speak to him, if you can think about that, that would be great. Okay. Okay, thank you. When the parties feel like they have sufficiently calmed down and are feeling more neutral, that is when I ask both of them to come back to a joint session. So the only time I come back to a joint session is when I get mutual agreement to do that from both sides. So Richard and Kavita, um, we are here together because both of you have thought about some potential uh, outcomes or solutions for the issue where someone would like to move away to have family help as well as someone would like to um, have the kids closer. So I'd like to see if you could offer some solutions to Richard that you know, uh, meets both of those goals? I can try. Okay. So um, I think that I can help, you know, resolve this problem to where the kids, you know, get to see their father. Um, I'm willing to, um, you know, bring the kids to you when you have a few days off. That way you're not traveling uh, too much. I can bring them for the weekend and then you get to spend some time with the kids. And provided that they don't have games, you know. Uh, right. Okay. And then, Richard, what are some of your ideas? Uh, well, I thought about it, and I think that one of the things we might want to consider that I, I hope would work for both of us uh, is that uh, if uh, Kavita needs to move to the Bay Area, and I understand why that's important to her and how it would be helpful, uh, then maybe we could arrange the uh, visitation so that I could spend a little bit more time with the kids. She could bring them down to Southern California uh, uh, for a weekend here and there on maybe a regular schedule. Uh, I would even be willing to pay for half of her airfare uh, to fly down so that she doesn't have to take on that entire financial burden. Uh, and. Uh, that would also give her family a break, uh, and it would give me an opportunity to spend a little bit more time with the boys. One of the strategies that I employ in order to get people to an agreement is instead of pitting person against person, is that I bring both people to the same side of the fence, and the issue is what is on the other side of the fence. So then they have to work collaboratively to problem solve and get to an amicable solution. As a reminder, I usually allow people to ask for a caucus if they are feeling too stressed out to be able to respond appropriately. So today, I believe the topic at hand is alimony, and I believe that you had some thoughts around that. So if you'd like to share that with us, that would be great. And Kavita, I will ask you to respond, actually re um, repeat back what you heard, and then respond once he is completed, okay? Okay. Well, you know, this is, this is a really sticky issue for us. I, I understand that, uh, you know, I understand that the uh, amount of alimony that uh, she's receiving is not really covering all of her expenses. Unfortunately, as a working actor, I can't always depend on having the same amount of money coming in from, you know, from month to month. Uh, and the amount that I'm giving her now, which I think is what, $1,200 or something like that, I, it's impossible for me to budget for more. I, the money isn't there. You know, I mean, I appreciate that she needs more, but she needs to appreciate that I can't, I don't, I can't give her what I don't have to give her. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, honestly, I, I don't know where you think the money, the extra money is going to come from. Okay. All right, hang on one second. So, Kavita, um, I would like to hear what it is that you heard from Richard. Um, yeah, he wants to give me no more than $1,200, and that's, can we just talk, please? Okay, so Kavita's asking for a private session, so right. I will go and speak with her, and then if you'd like to speak privately to me as well, I'll come back to you, okay? All right, fine, thank you. It's very critical for the mediator to have a calm demeanor. Energy is contagious, and so if I bring anxious 
energy or excited energy, it will transfer to the parties. It will make them feel how I am feeling. So what I try to do is I try to anchor the emotional tone of the conversation by remaining calm, having a soothing voice so that they also start to feel that way. Okay, congratulations to both of you. You do have an agreement. Um, I've drafted the memorandum of understanding. You can each sign it and then you'll, I will make a copy for each of you, okay? So if you wanna go ahead and take a look at that and then go ahead and sign right there. Okay, and then Richard, you can sign right there. <coughs> And there we go. So that is the end of the demo. So I hope you enjoyed the demo. If you have questions about that demo or anything else about mediation, I'm happy to take your questions. Well, first of all, that was great. <laughs> it was really good to see like, a real time exam exam example of you know how you kept it going and showed the empathy and respect for both part part parties. Um, and you're right you you maintained you know a calm energy and caught where you thought that the that their energy was changing. So. That was really, I'm really happy that you shared that with us. Awesome. Thank you. And I see, Pam, you have a comment in here that sometimes you don't listen because you're thinking of the words that you might want to use. And so what mediation does is it slows down the communication for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so it gives you the ability to just listen. And that's all you do is just listen because you want to try to say back what you heard or what you understood. So it doesn't have to be verbatim, but just what was your understanding of what you know we want to just make clear that the communication that what they're saying and what they're intending for you to hear is what you're hearing mm -hmm. right and then you can like spend some time responding so it slows it down so it does help a lot especially with people who stutter it slows it down significantly even my speech pattern is slowed down significantly when i'm in a mediation mm. I'd love for you to put in the chat or share with me, what did you, what specific things, what were the highlights of what you learned? If you want to drop it into the chat, that'd be great. The choice of language is critical. Comparing apples to apples, push people to settlement by comparing. If you go to settlement, here are the risks. If you go to court today, you'll you you know you will now have or do what you want. Exactly. Thank you very much. All right, that is all. Um, I'm going to just drop my contact information in the chat for anyone who wants to hold on to it. If you or anyone you know needs mediation, please contact me. Um, and here's my website. Thank you so much for having me. Tammy, thank you, Pam. Thank you. We real this was this was just amazing and um also interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. And for those of you still on the call with us, um, thank you so much. And join us again on December 5th. Um, Alice is going to be offering another amazing session on negotiation, how to get what you want, which is uh, really awesome for all of us to understand that better. <laughs> yes. So I will see you all again in December. Thanks for coming. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Alice. Thank Bye. you. Bye.